Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of a piece about uh, the first person I checked on on 9-11. Because I'm Japanese American, I was born right after the camps closed. And, uh, you know, I do what I do because I think, God, you know, if people had only stuck up for my parents and my grandparents. So, you know, when I see another black person murdered, when I see another Chicano or Central American deported, when I see another Middle East headline, you know, I go, never again, never again. When is this going to stop? So uh, on 9-11, the first person I went to check on, once I got over the shock of planes flying into buildings and buildings crumpling, was my corner grocer, Bob Shatara. Um, Palestinian Christian, moved to the US when he was five. Uh, his family went from displaced from Palestine to Lebanon to Michigan to San Francisco. And I found out much later that a lot of corner grocers and a lot of sandwich shops are run by Middle Easterners. And we just take them for granted, you know? So I made, I made a point of putting some photos of our friendly neighborhood terrorists in the book. You know, Good Frickin' Chicken, La Boheme, uh, you know, we don't think about these things that, uh, so, uh, unless we point them out. So, Bob has never seen his ancestral home on the West Bank, his neighborly, but his neighborliness was part of his DNA. His father's barber shop had been a social center in his old Ramallah neighborhood. And Bob's freezer case was the urban equivalent of a cracker barrel, a place to hang out and hash over the day's events until the news got too depressing to talk about. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I went over to Bob's after 9-11 to make sure he was all right, and I told him I'd come every day to check on him. A month later, after the US began, began bombing Afghanistan, I put on a, a hijab in support of Muslim women. I noticed I was sighed as I laid the car scarf across my forehead, folded it down over my temples and under my chin. With my heavy jaw and no forehead, I looked like an ape. But I couldn't cheat and expose my bangs like Audrey Hepburn in the 60s. To Muslims, a woman's hair symbolizes a private spiritual connection with Allah, so every strand had to be completely hidden. The soft cotton fabric refused to hold crisp folds along my temples. I needed bobby pins, but I didn't own any. When I was a kid, mom imposed despicable torture instruments on my body. But now I had wash and wear hair, and girdles and garter belts and hard pink rollers had been banished from my universe long ago. I had the freedom to choose what I wore and how I looked, and damn it, every Muslim woman deserved the same. So I finished fiddling with the scarf, headed out the door, and I noticed my steps were dragging. My stomach fluttered, my head thickened. I had the urge to go back to bed and pull the covers over my head. Suddenly, an old memory surfaced. It was 1952, I was six years old, walking home from school in Baltimore, head down, enjoying the lacy weeds growing up through the cracked sidewalk. Suddenly, I heard, <laughs> It's a Jap plane going in at 12 o'clock. Two big eight-year-old boys barreled down on me, arms outstretched like wings. I froze. <clears throat> sure, they were going to knock me over. Instead, they veed their arms ahead of them like torpedoes and whizzed narrowly past on either side of me, screaming, Gotcha, you yellow bastard. Boom! They imitated the screaming whistle of a smoking plane spiraling into the sea and then erupted into mocking laughter. My ears burned in shame and rage as I walked home in the springtime sun. Get a grip, I told myself as I <clears throat> smoothed my hijab. That was almost 50 years ago.